Good morning. Uh, thank you. You all can hear me by now. Robert, thank you for the very kind and warm, heartfelt message. Uh, I'm touched, I'm honored, and I'm nervous. <laughs> Sitting here with some of my cheering crew from Colorado, thank you. And um, looking out, I see a number of people who I think could rightfully just be right where I'm standing giving this talk. A lot of scleroderma experts here at the conference, and I'm just very grateful uh, to the Scleroderma Foundation for this opportunity. I'm charged with uh, the grand lecture, uh, which means somebody's going to be quoting me on a YouTube somewhere down the way. So I wore a tie and my zipper's up. OK. Um, and I got to be extra careful about what I say, like the zipper thing. Um, and I'm charged with a talk that is in some ways frightening. You know, it's, it's lung disease. It's in scleroderma. And there's a lot to talk about. So get moving, because you only have an hour. And the question is, do you talk about interstitial lung disease or pulmonary hypertension or both? Uh, we'll try to do a little bit of both. From a disclosure perspective, just to be clear, um, I do serve as a consultant for a number of pharmaceutical companies. And I think most relevant to this morning, discussing some clinical trials uh, that I serve as a consultant uh, for with those companies um, and have been an investigator, a steering committee member. I think other relevant disclosures, and I want to be really careful, right? Doctors, most of medical school is to try to figure out how do we confuse patients so we have a hard time with communication down the road. So we got to be really careful, right? Because we do a pretty good job of confusing patients, and we don't really want to do that. And I think lectures, even at 9.15 in the morning, are still a great way to catch up on sleep. So we'll be careful and mindful of both of those realities. And I said it as a joke, but not really. I mean, I am actually nervous because I'm talking about a disease manifestation, not to a group of healthcare providers like me, and I get to do that a lot, but I'm talking to people who are living with this disease. And I just want to be careful and humble and um, respectful of this battle that you all are facing. And that we as healthcare partners are just that. We are partners. We are providers, but partners in this journey. And I'm nervous because if you're going to talk about lung disease and scleroderma, let's face the facts. What we know is that lung disease is the driver of mortality more commonly than any other organ manifestation. From the European database, Eurostar, about 6,000 patients. And if you look at the causes of scleroderma-related deaths, 35% were due to this topic of interstitial lung disease, and 26% due to the other topic we're going to talk about, which is pulmonary arterial hypertension, and of course, many other causes. But I think it gives us significant reason for pause. Just to be clear what we're talking about, and I know that there's a concurrent localized scleroderma session going on right now, we are talking about systemic sclerosis, and we use the term scleroderma synonymously in this arena. And so if we wanted to provide an overview, and I'll try to go back and forth with my pointer so that everyone can see my tremor easily on both sides, but we say the term scleroderma for skin thickening, we're really not talking about localized forms this morning in this hall. We're talking about systemic sclerosis, and then we break it down a little bit of skin. I don't want to hit you in the head with my laser pointer, sir. I'm sorry. A little bit of skin, no skin, or a lot of skin. But this is not a skin disease. We're talking about systemic scleroderma, systemic sclerosis. And so when I say scleroderma, I really mean systemic sclerosis, which is the same thing as crest. So I don't really use the term crest. I just say systemic sclerosis or scleroderma. And limited applies to skin and not the lungs or other organs. So limited is not mild. Limited just means not a lot of skin. And diffuse does not always mean severe. Diffuse just means a lot of skin. So just to be sure, we're all talking the same language. We're talking about systemic sclerosis. And limited and diffuse only apply to skin, not the lungs. Now. If you're going to give a talk on ILD and pulmonary hypertension, well, what about survival and survival curves and survival statistics? Well, if that's what you came here for, you're not going to hear it from me. Survival statistics are misleading. They cause anxiety. I will not be showing survival curves, and I'll tell you a story as to why I won't. 
My patient, Mr. J, I meet him, summer of 2005, he's 73 at the time, he has severe shortness of breath and is found to have lung fibrosis and we didn't know why. Ultimately, we diagnosed him with scleroderma-related lung fibrosis, also has smoking-related emphysema, that's pretty bad, and he also has severe, uh, severe pulmonary hypertension. Summer of 2005, he's on six liters of supplemental oxygen at all times. We initiate immunosuppression for his lung fibrosis. We put him on inhalers for his emphysema, and we put him on PAH-targeted therapies, two at the time, for his PAH. We start having end-of-life discussions, fall of 2005. I meet his family. We have a family meeting. We block out an hour of time, and I tell him, listen, Mr. J., I'm really concerned about you. You have severe lung fibrosis, bad pulmonary hypertension, and also, by the way, you have smoking-related emphysema. I don't think you have a long time to go. I would say, you know, get your things in order, and if he wanted to know how long you live, probably about a year, maybe less. So let's fast forward to May of 2017. <laughs> so first of all, he knew I was here. He, I told him I was going to talk about him, and he said, tell him all I say hi, give him my best. Um, he's 85. He lives at home with his wife. He is very restricted in terms of his ability to get around. He has a man cave, which he loves. He watches sports. We always talk about movies and sports that he's watching. He's now on 10 liters of supplemental oxygen. He's no longer on immunosuppression. We still have him on his inhalers. He's on multiple drugs for his PAH. He sees me out every four to six months, and we joke. I'm like, hey, Mr. J, are you going to send me another card on your birthday to remind me how bad I am at prognostication? <laughs> So what's my message? My message is that survival statistics are often misleading and they cause anxiety. So you won't be seeing that from me and we always have hope and we shouldn't give up on hope and we're not good at prognosticating. Okay, so how are you gonna spend the next, well, now 45 minutes um, of this talk? Well, I wanted to talk mostly about interstitial lung disease and then rally around PAH at the end. So that is sort of based on scale of what I want to talk about. And I'm not good at math, I'll warn you now, but I said in my mind, I want this audience to walk away with five things about interstitial lung disease. I'm not very good at math, there'll be more than that. And then also I want you all to know about five things about pulmonary hypertension. Well, what is interstitial lung disease? So this is a group of diseases affecting or impacting the tissue of the lungs that we call the interstitium and it is either inflamed or fibrosed, scarred. And we use that term, practically speaking, with pulmonary fibrosis, really synonymously in our communication. This is inflammation or scarring of the lung tissue. And it is not the same as idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So if you go online, you type in pulmonary fibrosis, you may find things about IPF that have nothing to do with scleroderma lung fibrosis. IPF is pulmonary fibrosis as well, no known cause, not related to scleroderma. Different disease, different behavior. What does it look like? So this is what we call a coronal, kind of standing upright image of a CAT scan of a patient of mine who has scleroderma lung fibrosis, normal lung kind of on the top end here, and then the lower lung zone. So this is the spine, bones are white. This is the right lung, this is the left lung. And again on this side, right lung, left lung, and then the lower portion has that fibrosis. That's what interstitial lung disease, tissue-based inflammation or fibrosis scarring looks like. And then we, don't aim to confuse patients, but we do, and we turn the image differently now. Now the patient, it's the same patient, and I'll show you how we slice this in a moment. Now the patient's not upright. This is called axial imaging. Now the patient's head is way through the screen. I apologize. Is way through the screen. Um, and we are now looking at a cross section, a slice of their body. So now the lung is here, that's the interstitial lung disease. Here's the heart. That's the diaphragm. And then the liver beneath it, that's the esophagus. So we've just taken the patient who was upright, and we lay him flat, and we take a slice. And to maybe make that better or more clear, now I have that coronal again, okay, upright. Now here's the first slice up top here. So this is the top of their lungs. They're laying flat, and that's a cross section. Pretty normal-looking lungs. Now this line across here, that second line, 
is right here at the second slice, where you might see a little bit of what we call, where I'm from, schmutz, in the uh, outside of the periphery here, a little bit of gray haziness, okay? Um, and then the lower zone, that's that slice there, which we looked at. When you look at it now, you can see that it looks fibrotic, okay? So we have three slices on this scan correlating with that upright image. That's what lung fibrosis looks like. Now, many patients have very mild interstitial lung disease. Here is the liver on this patient, the stomach, here's the esophagus, here's the lung tissue, and here is the lung tissue. And what you are seeing is just a little bit of haze, very mild. Same thing here, very mild haze. This one has a little bit more moderate you know, what we call ground glass, which I was joking with that term schmutz, but the reality is, is that it just looks a little bit hazy in there. And then more severe looks like this. So here's your esophagus, here's the heart, here's the lung tissue. It looks a little bit more scarred, a little bit more scarred, the esophagus. And then I remind you, so this is the lung tissue, here's the liver, the heart, the esophagus. So now, these are all different patients with different scales of severity. So an important point is that we may find interstitial lung disease, and if we find it in these patients up top, that may not, may not be doing anything at all. Those patients on this slide would be worried much more about how severe they are. Now, how often do we see this? So about three quarters of the population of scleroderma, if undergoing a CT scan, about 75%, roughly, will have interstitial lung disease on a scan. And it may be very, very mild. But about a third total will have progressive interstitial lung disease that you have to worry more about and you have to maybe treat. But a lot of patients with scleroderma, when we get their baseline CT scan, have mild interstitial lung disease. And their shortness of breath really may be anxiety over interstitial lung disease, lung fibrosis, I went to the internet, I saw IPF, I found that I only have X amount of time to live. But that's not what we're dealing with. Sometimes it's just mild imaging findings. We do know that patients with a positive SCL70 do have a higher risk for progression of their interstitial lung disease. We also know that the more disease they have on their scan, the more likely that is to be more significant and or progressive. Sometimes we talk about early disease as a risk of progression, particularly in diffuse patients, but we don't always know, and we have to start with a scan and then see more about it from there. So what does scleroderma, thickened skin, a skin disease, have to do with the lungs? Well, again, we are only talking about the group of patients that have systemic sclerosis, not localized or morphia. And then irrespective of skin, all scleroderma patients are at risk for interstitial lung disease. And most, in fact, will have, I just told you, about three quarters of the systemic sclerosis patient will have interstitial lung disease. Now, skin thickening is very important for a lot of reasons that you all can tell me about but it doesn't translate to lung disease. So skin tells you about skin, and it doesn't tell you about the lungs. Now, if you wanted to know if a scleroderma patient had interstitial lung disease, this is your test of choice, a high-resolution CT scan. All those slices I just showed you, we rarely need a lung biopsy. Chest x-ray is not adequate. Neither are PFTs. If you want to know if your patient has interstitial lung disease with scleroderma, you need a high-resolution CT scan. So it is the modality of choice to detect scleroderma ILD. We have an easy time. I just showed you how we can break down those zones and see how much ILD, interstitial lung disease, there is. We can learn other things. This patient who may not have symptoms of reflux disease has reflux disease. That esophagus is not functioning properly. And you may even get hints of pulmonary hypertension on a CT scan. Not diagnosed, but hints of a CT scan that tells you maybe this patient has pulmonary hypertension. Why is chest x-ray inadequate? Well, if you look at two series, one with 23 patients, one with 289 patients, groups of scleroderma patients that went through a CT and a chest x-ray. So 
This group on the CT, wow, 91% of them had evidence of ILD, interstitial lung disease, by CT scan. That same group, though, if you only base on the chest X-ray, oh, only 39% of them have interstitial lung disease. So you're missing a lot of ILD if you're only relying on a chest X-ray. Okay, you're not impressed with a patient population of 23. Let's go to 289. 289 scleroderma patients, both CT and chest X-ray, 64% with ILD on a CT scan, only 22% by chest X-ray. So again, one of the things you're going to walk away with remembering HRCT scan, high resolution CT scan, is the only way to really know, without doing surgical lung biopsies, which we really don't want to do unless we need to. Um, and this is the test that's going to tell you whether your patient has ILD. But you also now need to know what's the functional impact. Okay, so you have a little bit of ILD or a lot of ILD. What is the impact on the patient? Well, be careful first when you talk about PFTs because abnormal PFT, pulmonary function test, does not mean the patient has interstitial lung disease. You can see abnormal PFTs for a variety of reasons, problems performing the test, problems with the coach of, 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 uh, who's giving you the guidance, maybe bad skin involvement, can't really take a deep breath, can't really blow out fully well. We also can sometimes get a false sense of security. Oh, my PFTs are normal. Yes, they're normal, but there's such a wide range of normal. 80% is normal, so is 120% normal. So if your level is 85%, is that great news because it's normal, or is it bad news because it was 100% a year ago, it was 110% two years ago, it was 120% before that. So you've had a major decline, and yet you've gotten reports that your PFTs are normal. Another piece to remember about PFTs is that you can still have significant interstitial lung disease with normal PFTs. So look at this one study, 102 patients, and just follow to this sort of maroon box here. So 102 patients, and then 63% of them had significant interstitial lung disease on a CT scan. 63% with significant ILD on a CT scan, and of those, 63% had significant ILD, but normal lung function. So significant interstitial lung disease, normal force vital capacity. And even look further, another smaller subset had severe lung fibrosis with a normal FVC. So a normal lung function test does not exclude interstitial lung disease, and abnormal lung function tests don't diagnose interstitial lung disease. Well, how about symptoms? Well, this is a challenge because everybody can raise their hand and say, yeah, I have shortness of breath, right? Because shortness of breath is pretty common. And what is it that gets you short of breath? And fatigue is another part of this symptom complex. And maybe cough. And cough could be from a variety of reasons. Medications, reflux disease predominantly, esophageal reflux disease is a very strong stimulus for cough. So our symptoms are not as helpful as you would think. And a patient could be short of breath for a lot of reasons, they're deconditioned, they have severe illness that is not necessarily lung, it's arthritic or skin, or they have heart disease, or they're anemic. Maybe depression can cause that. Maybe patients aren't always as reliable at reporters, and I could tell you, doctors are not so great and healthcare providers are not so great at assessing this. Again, cough is sometimes for other reasons, particularly in scleroderma, the esophageal reflux disease. So I would say two things here. Shortness of breath can be due to a number of causes, but be careful because the lack of reported shortness of breath does not mean the lack of interstitial lung disease. How about physical exam? Well, when we hear crackles at the bases, crackles, we hear what we saw on the CT scan, we think that that's going to be suggestive of interstitial lung disease, but again, lack of crackles doesn't mean lack of interstitial lung disease. And how about the skin exam? How's that going to help us with lung involvement? Well, it really won't. So the skin tells us about the skin. It does not tell us about the lungs. So how are we going to now determine? OK, so I have a patient who has an interstitial lung disease, and I need to know where are we? Or you all need to know where are you, right? Well, we want to know about shortness of breath. We want to know how much other disease is present that may be contributing. But we need to go beyond your symptoms, and we need to now objectify, do some testing. Not because we always love testing, but we do, but because we really want to put quantification and give us a better objective measure than I'm just more short of breath. Tell us more. 
So we do pulmonary function tests to put a number in place that we can follow over time. Force vital capacity, diffusing capacity. We do six minute walk tests to see how far you walk, what your oxygen does, what your heart rate and blood pressure do. And we wanna know, we wanna know how much CT evidence of disease there is, like you saw those pictures that I showed you. We're only going to necessarily treat, right? When are you gonna actually initiate therapy? Well, in patients that are impaired, that have clinically significant disease that are progressing, which then means, well, wait a second, you said about a third of patients progress, roughly, but about 70 or so percent have it. That means you got a lot of patients, maybe 40%, I'm, I'm making up the numbers, but I'm just commenting that a lot of interstitial lung disease that we detect in scleroderma is there, it's at the bases, it's mild, it hasn't been moving, it's not progressing, there are not a lot of symptoms with it, we're not treating those patients. We're watching them carefully. We're watching them carefully. But many patients with interstitial lung disease and scleroderma do not need specific therapy for it. They need surveillance. It's important to find it and important to follow it. How do we treat scleroderma ILD? I wish this slide was busier and had more evidence behind it and had lots of arrows and lots of cool things that I could show you about. This is how we start, then we move on to that one. You know, no, it's just not where we are yet. And I'm hoping we're gonna get there. A lot of people at this conference, investigators are people responsible for getting us there, so I give them a lot of credit for that. What do we do practically? Well, we probably almost always use these two drugs in our mind. These are the two drugs we're gonna to go to. First, we're gonna use mycophenolate, Celsept. We're gonna use cyclophosphamide, cytoxan, depending on scenario. And then the stuff on the right box I still think all of them deserve question marks because we don't have a lot of evidence yet. And we'll throw them into the mix if patients are maybe not responding to, not tolerating, or we can't use mycophenolate or cyclophosphamide. But before we talk about drugs, an important aspect is non-drugs. What do we do besides throw prescriptions of take this for three months and come back for another set of lung function tests? Pulmonary rehab. And uh, really nice slide I just pulled off the internet about an hour and 13 minutes ago. Um, <laughs> downloaded from them, wonderful site. Um, break the cycle, save your lungs. So there's this concept of, you know, I'm having a hard time breathing, then I'm disabled and I'm inactive. But, you know, then there's physical deconditioning and this horrible cycle that we want to break. And so pulmonary rehab, we want our patients to get out there, be active, use supplemental oxygen, treat their reflux disease, make sure they're being immunized appropriately, flu shots, pneumonia vaccines, et cetera, and mental health, of course. But what do we know about drugs? So really two pivotal trials to highlight. The scleroderma lung study one out of UCLA Oral cyclophosphamide versus placebo for 12 months, about 150 or so patients from around the country, a number of centers coordinated out of UCLA. And they, this group of investigators used a treatment algorithm of we're going to randomly assign patients in a blinded fashion to get oral cyclophosphamide, oral cytoxan for 12 months or placebo for 12 months and see how they do. And what was seen was that the patients who got drug, cyclophosphamide, overall did better, a little better, a little better, but enough to show significance that this drug works. It helps improve or you see less progression of lung decline, lung function decline, so a slight bump in lung function, several percentage points. Patients felt better. Patients felt better, less shortness of breath. That's so important in this disease. A little bit less skin thickening, and the CT scan showed some improvement. So what did we learn? That one year of cyclophosphamide compared to placebo, that treatment arm, they do better. But if you stop after one year, the patients by two years had already gone back to the placebo group. So one year of cyclophosphamide alone was helpful, but then, and it was even helpful for about 18 months. So it withstood beyond the 12 months of treatment, but by two years fell back to where the placebo arm was, meaning one year is just not enough. 
Scleroderma lung study two, also out of UCLA, group of centers around the country, about another 150 patients. This study compared oral cyclophosphamide like it did in the first one, but now instead of placebo, let's compare it to mycophenolate mofetil. Two years of CELSEP, two years of mycophenolate mofetil. Which arm is better? Is mycophenolate two years better than one year of cyclophosphamide? Well, in fact, both were effective. So both cyclophosphamide and mycophenolate mofetil were associated with improvements in lung function, improvements in skin. No difference between the two, maybe even cyclophosphamide a touch better perhaps, but not significantly so, but a nice response in both. Dramatic, no. Modest, yes. Mycophenolate was a safer drug, better tolerated, a better long-term option. So what have we learned from these two pivotal scleroderma lung studies? Well, first of all, huge success. We can conduct successful, positive clinical trials in scleroderma interstitial lung disease. Both cyclophosphamide and mycophenolate are, in fact, effective. And you can see positive effects on lung function, imaging, skin thickening, quality of life. Does this treatment regimen blow the disease out of the water, cure the disease? Absolutely not. Can you see improvements? Yes. Do we, need, do we need better therapies? Oh yeah, we need far better therapies. But these are two effective drugs, and that's a very, I think, um, nice statement and very exciting statement because we haven't been able to make that statement before. Very important two clinical trials to highlight. We also know that this is not a one-year treatment plan. You can't treat with oral cyclophosphamide for one year and think you're done. This is a long-term treatment approach. Highlighting point six, we still need more effective therapies. But what else do we have? We could talk about small series, rituximab, maybe some excitement. Not really the data yet to back up saying rituximab has a definite role in scleroderma ILD. Tocilizumab, Actemra, early study for phase two results. Maybe there's a signal in the lungs. Maybe we don't yet know this needs to be studied. You can't really recommend this in any evidence-based format. Do we try it? Of course we try it. We tend not to put it above cyclophosphamide or mycophenolate. Those are proven therapies. How about this hematopoietic stem cell treatment? Well, so if you look at the studies for that approach, a very dramatic and intense regimen, really helpful for the skin, can help the lungs, but we don't have that same confidence, and you wouldn't go to that before trying mycophenolate cyclophosphamide first. So it doesn't really have a defined role yet, specifically for scleroderma ILD, but I think it holds promise. Azathioprine, same idea. We probably don't think it's as effective as the other ones that have been proven, but we certainly use it. And maybe there's some other things that I've left off. Tacrolimus maybe is another one. Some people even like methotrexate, although it has some lung toxicity that we have to be careful about. But there are some other things to try. Um, but we don't have the same evidence basis. And we use corticosteroids sometimes at lower doses chronically. We don't think of steroids as really kind of your anchor for treatment in this disease. We worry about renal crisis. But I can understand why some patients who have scleroderma interstitial lung disease are perhaps on low-dose steroids for a variety of reasons, um, but not really a specific therapy for interstitial lung disease. So I made a comment before that scleroderma lung fibrosis is not idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. It's not IPF, and it isn't. But we can learn from IPF, and maybe we can borrow from some of the exciting advances that have been made in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So the treatment of IPF, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, had a major breakthrough from the standpoint of pharmacologic intervention and available therapies. Fall of 2014, in the New England Journal of Medicine, two pivotal sets of trials were published, the IMPULSUS and the ASCEND trials. And if you look on the left box, so for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, this novel antifibrotic agent, nintetinib, commercially known as OFEV, showed reduction in decline of lung function over time. Side effects, predominantly diarrhea, but overall well tolerated. And so the FDA approved OFEV, nintetinib, for IPF. Not scleroderma lung fibrosis, but a different type of lung fibrosis condition. And similarly, the ASCEND trial showed that a different novel antifibrotic, perfenidone, was 
shown to be associated with a reduced decline in lung function. So patients who got that drug had less decline of their lung function compared to placebo. It was also well tolerated, but it had other gastrointestinal side effects. So what did that leave us with? Well, let's talk about IPF just for a moment, and then we'll go focus on scleroderma lung fibrosis. But for IPF, what changed as of 2014 was that what used to be a treatment of clinical trials and get a lung transplant now went over to profenadone and nintedinib. And that's the current reality for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Immunosuppression doesn't work in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, so immunosuppression's not on this. But let's talk now about scleroderma ILD. So where are we now? So for scleroderma ILD, and in fact, essentially all other forms of progressive lung fibrosis, progressive interstitial lung disease, we use immunosuppression. I just showed you the cyclophosphamide mycophenolate story, so to speak. But now there are clinical trials that are going on, and some of them have profenadone and nintedinib as options, and we still have lung transplantation as an option. So what are we learning now about these novel antifibrotics? So we're learning that they probably are, at least from this study, tolerable, well tolerated, and similar in tolerability as they are in IPF. So if you look at a group of patients with scleroderma interstitial lung disease, 60 in total, who had ILD, got profenadone for four months. About 60% were on mycophenolate also. What did we learn? Well, this was not an efficacy study. It was not looking to see if it works. And that may be frustrating, but it's just reality. It's a phase two study, four months. You're not going to tell me anything about efficacy from this trial, but you could tell me how did they tolerate it for those four months. And in fact, the patients tolerated profenadone fine and just as fine if they were on background mycophenolate or not. So that's what we learned from the LOTUS study. Now we have another exciting trial, and this one's active and enrolling. This is the census trial target of about 500 patients, huge trial around the world, nintedinib versus placebo in scleroderma ILD for 12 months. Importantly, patients are allowed to be on background mycophenolate. They can be on low-dose prednisone. A lot of these patients are on background mycophenolate. A lot of them are not. So in some, we have a true placebo, and in some, we have patients who are on background MMF, and so you know, they are getting some therapy for their ILD. But the randomization is, whether you're on background MMF or not, you go into a placebo arm, or you get nintedinib. And we're looking to see, the company is, and I am a consultant, I'm on the steering committee again, fully disclosed, primary endpoint, annual rate of decline in lung function over 12 months. Does this drug, compared to placebo, impact lung function? Other things that want to be you know, derived or learned from this study, do patients have less skin thickening? Do they have less shortness of breath? Do they feel better? Another trial, and I'm, on an, invest I'm an investigator in this as well, the scleroderma lung study out of UCLA and out of Michigan, which is to be opening very soon, about 150 patients are going to be targeted here around the country. All of these patients are going to go on background mycophenolate. So everybody goes on background mycophenolate, and then the randomization is to placebo or to profenadone. Placebo or profenadone with background mycophenolate. Patients can be on low-dose prednisone. What do we want to learn? Does that treatment approach, and they're looking at an 18-month course, not the 12 months I just showed you on the census trial, a year and a half, does this approach impact lung function, and how so? Key secondary endpoints. Do the patient's skin scores change? Does, it, does profenadone compared to placebo impact skin score? How about quality of life? And what does the CT scan look at? And what does it look like? Now, this is an exciting, I mean, this is an exciting, exciting time because we have these trials with agents that have been proven in a different disease. So how do we follow these patients longitudinally? Well, this is why doctors run late, okay? Because we gotta do all this, right? And this isn't including electronic medical records. And anybody who's been seeing me in the last few weeks when our dictation system's down, I mean, I've been grumpy as anything in clinic because I can't dictate. I gotta type notes, I gotta be a secretary. Susan, my nurse practitioner over here, is probably just saying, why is he saying this at the podium? Um, but, but she knows why, because next week's not going to be fun. Longitudinal assessment of ILD and scleroderma. Well, how are their symptoms? What's your exam? What's going on besides your lungs? 
What about your scleroderma? What about your ILD? How's your lung function? What do your CAT scans look like? Oh, by the way, are you anemic? And are you having reflux disease? And is pulmonary hypertension looming? Well, most importantly for following interstitial lung disease and scleroderma, it's going to be lung function. So I, I beat up lung function tests. I said you can't diagnose ILD with lung function, and you can have normal lung function and have ILD, and you can have abnormal lung function and not have ILD right. So we're not talking about diagnosing ILD, but how do you manage or longitudinally assess? Well, that's where PFTs, pulmonary function tests, are super helpful. They're really great at longitudinal assessments. Not great to diagnose. Ideal for assessing progression. We don't want to do CAT scans every three months. A lot, of radi a lot of radiation, unnecessary radiation exposure. And you may not see a change on a CT scan in that short window. But pulmonary function tests, reproducible, relatively inexpensive. You can trend these values over time, and it may even give you a hint as to pulmonary hypertension. And what do we do? We make up you know, scoring or graphs. How is our patient's forced vital capacity percentage over time? What is our diffusing capacity percentage over time? How are our patients feeling? Are they tolerating their medication? What do those lung function tests look like? What is their six minute walk test looking like? And yes, what does their CT scan look like? And we'll do that occasionally, not so frequently, maybe every couple of years in some patients. And Right now, I still think this is our reality for scleroderma interstitial lung disease. We are not seeing treatments that dramatically, well, gone. All that lung fibrosis, gone. No, we're really looking at can we stabilize patients who are otherwise progressing and are otherwise at risk for decline. Lung transplant. Well, I will tell you, depending on where you work, it may be hard to get patients evaluated or even accepted into a lung transplant program, sometimes the burden of disease. It's not just a lung problem. Too much else going on. Sometimes it's the esophagus, very dilated esophagus. Sometimes, and that may hurt or damage the, the transplanted lung. Variety of reasons. Some, some patients are just you know, not able to go to the go through with a lung transplant, they're rejected, so to speak. And I should comment, this is not our first line approach. These are patients who have really progressed, patients who have, so to speak, failed uh, conventional therapy, and you're really worried about how they're gonna do longitudinally. And you make difficult decisions about saying, well, they're very severe, my medications aren't as helpful as I'd like them to be, maybe we should consider lung transplant. And in those scenarios, sometimes patients are rejected for a variety of reasons. But what we do know from the centers that have carefully selected patients who are deemed acceptable candidates, in fact, patients tend to do as well as other forms of chronic end-stage lung disease, like other forms of pulmonary hypertension or other forms of pulmonary fibrosis. So in patients that do need a lung transplant, if evaluated, deemed an acceptable candidate, I think there is hope with lung transplantation, and it really is a center-based experience. Uh, different centers are more likely to consider uh, patients with scleroderma lung fibrosis uh, for lung transplant. So you'll know I'm really bad at math, okay? Because I got like 12 things here. Um, five things you need to know about interstitial lung disease. I have three bullets with each one having like seven, so do the math, it's not five. But try to get five out of this, okay? So five things you need to know about interstitial lung disease. So pulmonary fibrosis, synonymous with ILD, large group of diseases, inflammation or fibrosis of the lung tissue. About three quarters of scleroderma patients will have interstitial lung disease on a CT scan. About 30% total will have progressive interstitial lung disease. The SCL70 antibody is an important risk factor. There are some others, but really highlighting that one. Treatment, well, that's going to be for those patients who have clinically significant progressive ILD. Just by finding ILD does not mean they need treatment. And then the high-resolution CT scan is really the test of choice to know if the patient has interstitial lung disease, and we rarely do a surgical lung biopsy. I'm up to like number 12 on the list of things. So now the last five things. So what else did we learn? Cyclophosphamide, mycophenolate, proven therapies for scleroderma interstitial lung disease. Really modest benefits, but proven therapies. 
And exciting clinical trials are underway. And novel therapeutics in the pipelines, which I didn't talk about, are also being considered. And for now, stability equals success for this disease. And I talked about how lung function tests are not adequate to diagnose ILD, but are super helpful for longitudinal assessment. Last little part of this talk, 15 minutes. What about pulmonary hypertension? So what is pulmonary hypertension? Well, we are talking, I mean, this, and this needs maybe a marketing campaign for a new name because, you know, this is, I don't think people appreciate how devastating this is from that name, you know, because hypertension is everywhere, right? But that's systemic hypertension. But what about pulmonary, well, it's just high pressures. No, we worry about this because of that word, that, those three words, right heart failure. This is a complication where pulmonary pressures are elevated in the circulation of the lungs, but ultimately this leads if untreated, right, if progressive, it leads to ultimately right heart failure. So that's what the concern is with pulmonary hypertension. It's elevated pulmonary pressures, lots of causes, and scleroderma is one of them. We're talking about the pulmonary arterial circulation, pulmonary arterial hypertension, where you get restricted flow through that circulation, and then if untreated, if progressed, it ultimately leads to right heart failure. So a couple of points to highlight, pulmonary hypertension, pH comes in a few different forms. I'll show you a big confusing slide that you have no business looking at on a Saturday morning, 40 minutes into your 55 minute talk. I'll show you that in a second. But the key here is does the patient have PAH, pulmonary arterial hypertension? This was the slide I warned you about. And this is a group of diseases. So we have classes, class one, and two, rather group one, group one prime, group two, three, four, five. What we really want to know in this scenario for our patients is do they have this entity called PAH, pulmonary arterial hypertension? And this is a thorough assessment to make sure it's not a blood clot in their lungs. It's not sleep apnea. It's not their interstitial lung disease. It's not their left heart disease. It's this elevated pressures in the arterial circulation of the lungs, PAH. And that's a right heart catheterization, no way around it. That's a right heart catheterization defined entity. And we know what the parameters on the cath need to be. They need to have a high mean PA pressure of greater than or equal to 25 millimeters of mercury. They need to not be volume overloaded. They have to have a low wedge pressure as we call it. I told you this is all about confusing patients, right? By now you all are agreeing with me. Um, and this is about more than what we call wood units to tell you how high the pressure is. So this is a right heart catheterization defined entity. And why is this so important? Because when you talk about advances in scleroderma, and survival and improvement, it's about the PAH success story, whereby now we have more than 10, 14, 15 drugs that have been approved by the FDA that impact favorably on patients with this lung manifestation of their scleroderma. This is a treatable manifestation. Doesn't mean everybody responds, but that's how our approach is, which makes us want to look for it and catch them and pick it up as early as possible. And that's where rheumatologists are essential to this evaluation. Why, I mean, we got all these drugs that I'm not gonna talk about. I'm just gonna tell you that we have a growing list of drugs for PAH. And we got three boxes not because I'm an Orioles fan and a Rockies fan, but I am. So we got purple and black for the Rockies, we got black and orange for the O's, uh, but what I'm talking about is that we got three boxes that are unique in their pathophysiology, how they work, and they can be synergistic. So now you're looking at a scenario where patients are on one drug, on two drugs, maybe three drugs from different arms. So if I'm a rheumatologist seeing lots of scleroderma, I know I got lots of options that my pulmonary hypertension treating doctor has at his or her disposal. I got to find these patients as early as I can because I have good options now. So in contrast to my interstitial lung disease, we got CELSEP, we got Cytoxan, we got not a lot else, right? This is an exciting area. We have lots and lots of drugs. So how do we deal with this? Well, this is complicated. And I will tell you, many PAH patients go on combinations of therapy. Some are on mono, one drug. If you're on one drug, you don't have to call your doc right after this talk and say, Fisher said, I gotta be on two. No, many patients are on more than one drug. And they're on combinations from different arms. And it's gotten more and more complex. 
many patients find that they just have to be at a pulmonary hypertension center or see a doc who does pulmonary hypertension as the norm, right? Not to disparage against asthma, but if your pulmonologist only treats asthma, maybe they're not the best pH treating doctor, I don't know. I'm just telling you it's gotten complicated. And a lot of patients go to pulmonary hypertension programs to figure out what's gonna be the best combination for them. I'll tell you, I'm a rheumatologist. I do a lot of lung disease care. I tend to not really manage my patient's pulmonary hypertension. I need right heart specialists to help me do that. That's usually a partnership. So what do we know about scleroderma and pulmonary hypertension? So we know a few things. We know a lot of things. Um, we know that a long, the longer the patient has scleroderma, actually, the higher their risk of getting PAH. Why do I say that? Because sometimes we see patients who've had Raynaud's phenomenon for 30, 40 years. They've had reflux disease for 30, 40 years, and maybe we lose vigilance. No, 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 exactly the opposite. That's the patient you gotta watch closer. That's the patient you have to watch closer. So long-standing disease is a risk factor. Early patients can get it as well. But we don't wanna lose vigilance in those long-standing, so to speak, limited, only have a centromere, oh my gosh, that's the group I'm worried about. They have a centromere antibody, they have Raynaud's phenomenon, they have reflux disease, they've had it for 30 or 40 years, their telangiectasia have gotten worse, that's the patient I'm worried about as a higher risk. What does the skin have to do with the lungs here? Again, not a, not a lot. I mean, you probably see more PAH and limited, so to speak, but you know, these are just, I think we have to be careful about those broad-based statements. So what can we say in general? About one in eight scleroderma patients, around 10 to 15% of scleroderma gets PAH. I told you that the longer they have the disease, they're higher the risk of PAH. There's nothing for that bullet, so I won't say anything about it. All patients with scleroderma are at risk though. All patients with scleroderma are at risk. So there's no such thing as, oh, I only have diffuse, I don't have the limited, I don't have the centromere antibody, I don't have to worry about it. No, all scleroderma patients do need to be vigilant, and we have to be aware that the skin is important, but it doesn't tell us about their lungs. The symptoms are relatively nonspecific, right? Fatigue, a little bit of shortness of breath, um, maybe some chest pain, maybe a little bit of edema, but there's not a symptom that tells the doctor, aha, they must have pulmonary hypertension. Symptoms can be helpful, unexplained shortness of breath, the change in shortness of breath, the change in fatigue, more lower extremity edema, of course. Those are things that we're gonna to have to look at carefully, but they're not that specific. And I can tell you, and as I see you know, Dr. Steen in the audience, um, nobody here deserves more credit, in my opinion, for showing us as rheumatologists that we could be at the forefront here in terms of getting these patients, getting scleroderma patients diagnosed earlier and really impacting their disease course. Outcomes are better when PAH is picked up earlier in general, right? And as such, because of that statement, we can then say that every patient with scleroderma should be assessed annually to make sure that they don't have pulmonary hypertension. That doesn't mean if you're short of breath and having new problems that you wait till your March visit, because I saw him last March. No, that just means when you don't have symptoms, you're coming in annually to be sure that even in the absence of symptoms, a patient hasn't developed pulmonary hypertension. If they have symptoms, well then we're evaluating them to explain their symptoms. But the screening assessment, as I tell my female patients, is like the mammogram. You don't wait for trouble to get your mammogram. You get your mammogram every year because we know that outcomes are impacted by disease detection at earlier stages. Same idea here with PAH. Our non-invasive tests. I was telling you all about those CT scans and diagnosing interstitial lung disease. It's not the same for pulmonary hypertension. There isn't a non-invasive test that doesn't exist. This is a right heart catheterization diagnosis. Echocardiograms shouldn't be saying the patient has moderate pulmonary hypertension. It suggests pulmonary hypertension. Echocardiograms suggested. I've had patients tell me, well, if it can't tell me anything, you know, maybe I can get a rebate on the echo. You know, maybe you can <laughs> cut the price down. It's not that helpful, you just told me. Uh, declining, D talk to your cardiologist. Declining DLCO, don't tell him I said that. Declining DLCO, we've learned that when that diffusing capacity on pulmonary function tests that we follow, if that's dropping, but there isn't a change in lung fibrosis, or there isn't a change in imaging, or there isn't a change in their force vital capacity, they're more short of breath and the DLCO is dropping. That's a hint. It's not a diagnosis, it's a hint. PAH can only be diagnosed by a right heart catheterization, not by an echo or PFTs. 
Small study, but I think an important one out of France, just to kind of highlight that if you, as a provider, maybe say, I'm not that good in my routine practice. I want to tighten it up. I want to put together some kind of algorithm that I'm going to use to diagnose pulmonary hypertension early. That's my goal. I may get unnecessary, so to speak, or normal right heart caths as a result, because I may do right heart catheterizations perhaps more regularly than I would otherwise. But if my goal, I want to detect disease earlier, what if I put in place some kind of a rigid program whereby I say, if you have these parameters, you get a right heart cath. So that's what this group did. Small number of patients, but I think an important lesson. These FC1, 2, 3, and 4 is about disease stage. The lower the functional class, the earlier the disease. Okay, so goal would be to get as many patients as possible, excuse me, diagnosed early, functional one or functional class two, not functional class three or four. So let's look at our routine practice cohort. Biggest bar, already with moderately severe disease. Second biggest bar, very severe disease. That's my routine. That's me being my doc like I always do. Now what if I ramp this up? and be much more, perhaps, proactive with my right heart catheterizations, now the curve shifts. More patients are being diagnosed functional class two. And that's our goal in rheumatology. We're scleroderma doctors taking care of patients who don't have pulmonary hypertension. Our objective, we can't prevent the disease, but we can diagnose it as early as possible. Now, that's just their functional class. How did their right heart cath look? How did the health of their heart look? Well, again, I think impressive. Small number of patients, but an important lesson. So these parameters are what we derive on a right heart cath, right atrial pressure, and a higher pressure is bad, okay? So this is my routine practice, higher right atrial pressure. In my kind of tightened up algorithm, they have a lower right atrial pressure, so they look healthier that way. Cardiac index, you want a better, you want a better cardiac index here, so the stronger the index, right, the higher the number. So my detection cohort, boy, they have a healthier looking heart. It's pumping perhaps more favorably or stronger, so to speak. And then our vascular resistance, how high is the actual pressure in the circulation? Again, there we want a lower number because we want lower pressure. Again, my routine practice, not as good. And then very impressive. The group that was in this active detection cohort lived longer, lived longer than those that were screened through routine care. I think the message is that even though we're, you know, we're good, I'm good at detecting pulmonary hypertension, maybe we can all tighten it up. And we have algorithms now. We have the detect algorithm. We have other recommendations that have been put forward to do better at finding these patients earlier. And this is a team game. Right, so if you're a rheumatologist, you're working with your primary care doctor, you're working with your lung doctors and your heart specialists, really with an aim for de detecting as early as possible this finding, this lung manifestation, pulmonary hypertension, and you're gonna need a right heart catheterization to confirm the diagnosis and help guide therapy. It gives us a, ha a handle on how we can exclude other causes. And remember, there are a lot of causes of pulmonary hypertension, so we have to exclude sleep apnea. A bad interstitial lung disease can cause pulmonary hypertension. Liver diseases can. Okay, so other things can. Blood clots to the lungs can. And so we have an extensive evaluation to identify PAH. They need the right heart catheterization. And then with the right heart cath, which is not a lung biopsy, it's an IV. It's a big IV into a large vein, but it's an IV. And it is not the biopsy. It is a, as, non, as invasive procedures go, this one we're comfortable with. In the best of hands, cardiologists who are familiar with this procedure, this is a no-brainer of a procedure considering what's at stake. Okay, what math problems do we have now? So five things that you need to know about pulmonary hypertension. So PH comes in a few different forms, and the key is finding out if the patient has PAH. The longer a patient has scleroderma, yes, we worry about their risk. Remember that centromere antibody is an important risk factor. All scleroderma patients are at risk for PAH, uh, but we can enrich our surveillance by knowing more about their type of scleroderma. K 
Key point number three, outcomes, you know, we can't prognosticate, we can't predict who's going to respond, but I can tell you if a patient is diagnosed late, I have a much harder time with their outcome than if they're diagnosed earlier as a general statement. So our goal in rheumatology, taking care of scleroderma, is not to be, you know, sort of lax. We are going to be on the front end of screening with the goal of detecting, not screening so I could check off the box that I did my echo, but screening with the knowledge that I may have to do more right heart casts than I thought I had to do. And every scleroderma patient, not symptoms, PAH annual assessment. With symptoms, you're calling your doctor tomorrow, okay? This is it without symptoms. PAH, you've already heard 12 times, only diagnosed by a right heart cath. And I think, you know, when I talk about where is the excitement and what we've done, you know, this is an exciting area. We have lots and lots of drugs, lots of different options. It's gotten super complicated, lots of good drug options, and it's been complicated enough that we really need pH treating specialists these days. So I wanted to end on two quotes. I'm going to embarrass Sandy. Sandy, is it okay if I put this up? Oh, thanks. Okay, so, you know, as a provider seeing scleroderma patients, you know, you all teach us so much. And, and we learn how to live life by caring for you and seeing how you all live your lives facing so much adversity. So Sandy's a longtime patient of mine. Um, and I asked her, I gave her a lot of notice. I emailed her like 3.30 yesterday afternoon. Um, Sandy, please send me a quote. And this is one that, that's original to Sandy. Attitudes are contagious. Make yours worth catching. So thank you to Sandy for that. And then another hero of mine, uh, another patient of mine, Ken Urban. Ken's got really bad diffuse scleroderma. He actually did give me permission. Um, he's not here. Um, nothing in the universe, this is original to Ken, nothing in the universe can change where I'm at. All I can do is my best moving forward. Thank you, Ken Urban. Thank you all again for this opportunity. Appreciate it very much.